this is, this is a great title here. Uh, you know, one of the first things that we want to make sure is that, yes, our community is buying homes, but now that we got that first wave of, of homeowners, the next step is actually to start investing and thinking about passive income, because that's what's going to create really great wealth, right? Going after commissions, closing loans, that's active income. As soon as you stop doing that, Income stop, but you want to start making money while you sleep. So this is the panel that we're going to look into because it's very important. So start thinking about legacy. Start thinking about exactly what we're talking about is which is Hispanic Well Project, and that's exactly what we're going to be here talking about. So with that being said, you know the Brevilla, uh, you know uh, colleague of mine, obviously leader of uh, of today's time and national president. Uh, you know you're a top producer within your market. And uh, you deal with a lot of uh, first-time home buyers. How do you talk to them about investing? I mean, yes, you got your home, but now about investing in, in income property. Um, so. That's a great question, and, and being that um, you know I, I say it often, I uh, represent majority of first-time home buyers, uh, you know, year over year, and the reason is is because we I really strategically talk to people who become homeowners as people that can build their perf the, su portafolio. So in essence, I'm not training them to become the next seller for me. I'm training them to buy their next property with me, and so that's the reason why we have you know such a high re uh, return of buyers um, in our team. And pretty much what it is, is real estate, the real estate industry uh, changed my life. It changed my family's life, right? My, it started with my parents buying their first property. Um, they don't speak English. They were, you know, at that time making $5 an hour, $4 an hour. And they bought their first property with their, the cousin. You know, my dad half sees with the cousin because that's all he can afford at the time. And so I, I was able to see through them how real estate can change someone's life and it doesn't matter where they come from how much you know how much education do they have a lot of money or not but if they start um, and and they put that for, uh, for first foot forward then they can start building something so it changed it changed our lives and so when I got into real estate I was my parents translator of course and I was able to say you know what what if I can t teach other people what I have learned? through my parents, and I began to do it, and then you begin to really see what you're able to do with those families when they follow you and they trust you. You're able to see how it transforms their, their lives. Because yeah, money's not everything, but you know what, it helps a whole lot, especially our, our familias, right? When they have, when they don't have to worry about, you know, living paycheck to paycheck, and they start talking about, well, you know, how could I rent this property to my, my uncle or my, you know, they need, a, they, need, they need a property and they can't buy, but I can buy. Can I buy? Yes, you can. So then I'm, I'm moving on to my next property. So for me, it was a natural process. Um, that's why I love this industry so much. Again, it changed my family's life. And so that's pretty much what I teach. I live by that. And, you know, social media, if you follow me, that's what I'm talking about in Spanish all the time is thinking about your uh, wealth building in the idea of creating, you know, your portafolio to, you know, and that's a big thing for me. So uh, easy to be able to talk about it when that's what you've lived and that's what you know. Great story. And Nora's, you know, story is, is I'm sure it can be duplicated across the, the audience here. Um, who here invests in uh, income property? Who has income property? Who has investments? Love it. Uh, that's what 50% of the crowd. I would love to see 100% of the crowd in the next five years. Uh, and what I mean by that, you guys got to be intentional. When they're talking and they're giving you strategies and understanding exactly what you need to do, please write that stuff down because this is the next wave. We already got the 49% the of first time homeowner Latinos. Now the next part is start getting into income property, start buying apartments, talking about doors, start, start having lunches about how many doors you're going to get in the next five years, right? Oh, I'm going to get 50 doors, I'm going to get 60 doors. Let's start talking about that conversation, right? versus what's going on, what happened in Sending Sunset. No, that's not what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about the real life wealth building ideas because great people talk about ideas, right? Low level people start talking about people. We talk about ideas and, and growth, so remember that. So Nora, real quick before we move on to Gabby and um, Julian, how many doors have you gotten invested in so far? 
And um, you know, what got you going? Yeah, absolutely. So I invest with my family. So I have we have an investment company, and we own over 150 doors right now in multiple states. And uh, we believe a lot in multifamily. And we got involved into wholesaling probably about eight, nine years ago, get deals, you know, off-market deals, and really get that going. We run a small team for flipping every year, so we obviously believe in creating inventory as well. And so, yeah, that's, you know, going at it on my own. And I think one of the one of the things that we wanted to touch on sometimes, how can you scale or how can you think about, you know, investing and growing is sometimes you have to understand what you do well, and then you have to recruit other people to do the other things that you do not do well that don't come easy to you. You either recruit them, hire them, or you partner up with them, right? That is the key to being able to scale. And so that was uh, important. And so in in my passion in representing for Simon Buyers and being a great real estate agent, I understood that the investing side takes a whole lot and so I was able to partner up with the family, and uh, that was the key. And so that we were able to scale, grow, and that's where we're at right now. Okay. And yeah, great. Thank you so much, Nora. Gabby, EXP yeah. investor. How important is mentorship and the technologies out there to help you grow your portfolio and investment? And that's one question. The other one is, what's your portfolio look like? Hello. <laughs> I'm Gabby. Uh, right now, um, my portfolio consists of 13 doors, and it has a variety of like Airbnb, long-term rentals, Section 8, and corporate housing. So that's what I focus on. And back to the question. Um, oh, and I also do fix and flip, so just depends on how much I take on per year. Um, for the question, I think mentorship is super important. Um, on my first flip that I did in 2018, I completely failed. Um, it was a complete flop. I thought it was easy. I followed HGTV's advice, and <laughs> yeah, they're not a mentor. Um, I bought the ugliest house on the block, and it was actually a crack house, and everybody wanted the house. It had multiple offers, so it must make sense, right? No. It didn't. It made no sense whatsoever. Um, the house needed a complete, like, almost a teardown. Um, it was horrible, and it was very, very stressful. And I did end up lucking out because a contractor who helped me on that project fell in love with the work because I over-designed it. And he ended up buying it, and I was only, I only lost a little bit in comparison to what I would have lost if it kept staying on the market. However, I learned everything hands-on myself. So it's me and my sister, we're a team, and we just thought that um, it was easy, but it wasn't. And so if I had the right mentorship, I would have been able to scale my career way faster rather than losing and learning the hard way and really stressing myself out and just being scared all the time. One of the things that probably happened to Gabby and many others is that when we first starting out to flip, for example, uh, the emotional side starts taking over, and then we start losing the uh, analytical part of it. Like, does this deal make sense? Because we all want to start flipping because it sounds great. I want to have the name on it. Like, hey, I want to do it. I want to make sure I did one. But then we don't look at the numbers. Not saying that happened to Gabby, but sometimes that's what it overtakes, and that's how we start losing money on that first deal because of, we let the emotional part into it. We start imagining that this has to make sense. This has to be profitable because I'm gonna work on it. I'm gonna make this a much, much more beautiful home out there. And sometimes it doesn't matter. The market dictates what's, what happens and you, 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 know, you don't see the surprises and the pitfalls. So one of the things is that inventorship, like you said, is very, very key. So we here at NAREP have so many put mentors that have already income property, has flipping uh, experience. So this is an uh, opportunity for you guys after this event to start contacting people that are in, in the networking reception to start really looking and seeing how do you guys can learn from flipping and actually getting income property. So it's very key. So, you know, you guys have talked about the doors you guys got and the experiences you got with your story, with your flipping and your doors. Then at some point, we start to think about scaling, right? And how do we scale? How do we go from Look, I got a duplex. How do we go to 10 doors? How do we go to 20 doors? How do we go to 60 doors? How does that happen? Like, do I have to wake or I have to work even harder? No, there's easier methods to do that. 
then there's pitfalls that we may encounter. So Julian Mills over here, he's you know big guy, big time guy who's definitely has a portfolio, and he has a couple of things to say about pitfalls that you, you can encounter and also how to scale. So Julian, what's up, brother? Uh, so pitfalls. Um, yeah. One pitfall that I would always say is um, cash flow management. So in two years, I actually got 75 units in two years. Um, and I just recently sold 12, so I'm down to like 65. But my biggest pitfall was cash flow management and properly budgeting because there was times where I didn't know about certain repairs that were going to happen, unexpected, some capital expenditures, um, and just to not be labeled a slumlord to where you're negating some of these um, repairs and you're just pushing them off rather than um, having, how did I say it, a, a good reputation um, and making sure you're taking care of your tenants. And so that was one of my biggest pitfalls. And now I budget setting aside certain amounts because when I first started, all it was was about growth and how many doors can I get. And instead of putting money aside for repairs, capital expenditures, it was just all about growth. And now I've got to a point where we have systems and processes in place with the staff and everything else to where we have a certain amount set aside for growth to properly manage. And that was one of the biggest things in how I was able to scale within two years to get 75 plus doors. At the age of 32, I had 32 properties. And so, yeah. So did you do that through 1031 exchanges? Uh, did you find uh, these, these properties through uh, networking, what did you do to find that? Uh, and then uh, basically the scale sailing problem, it sounds to me that you grew too fast, your foundation was weak in the bottom and that's kind of got you down a bit. Eventually you figured it out, got that system going on, but how did you find these opportunities? Who did you meet with? Um, how'd you learn this uh, the scaling? So it was a variety of ways. My very first deal was actually on Zillow. The dude didn't even know how much properties were worth. And I did an owner finance deal where I actually got paid because there was actually no seasoning. And so I put it under contract for a certain amount and I knew that it was worth greater than that. And next thing you know, I went to the bank, refinanced, and I got money in my pocket and it was already cash flowing. And that was my first one, that was on Zillow. Then I started understanding Facebook, Facebook groups, um, different wholesalers, mailer lists, all those different things to where now I've built up a reputation where people actually come to me with the deals um, and realtors and everything else. Um, like one property, which I just got the appraisal today, I bought for 35,000. It just got appraised for 455 and I only put 250,000 and that's literally happened today and everything else um, right before I came here. And it, I found that one from a realtor. Realtor just came to me with it. And we re, rehabbed it and everything else. And now, literally, I'm about to refinance 80% LTV and everything else. So Love it, love it. This is an opportunity for you guys to take your hat off for those who are real estate, real estate practitioners, lenders. Put an investor hat on and start focusing on that, fo focusing on what he's talking about, where you have other realtors doing the work for you and looking for these great deals out there that you may not find. Because sometimes we get so busy in our work and our daily lives that we don't really have time to start looking into the long-term investments for our, for our portfolio. And so that's very key for us to understand that. So Gabby, what, is your, what are your goals? I know you said you had 13 doors now. What are your, what's your goal for five years and how do you intend to do that? In five years, I plan on retiring. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but um, I guess each year we just plan on growing the portfolio even more. Um, we don't plan on over leveraging because like you said, cash flow is a problem. So you need to make sure that you're always within your means, especially when you have rentals, something always breaks and you know, you need to account for other things besides breaking like vacancies, evictions and all that kind of stuff. So, but within five years, um, I do a lot of fix and flips and this year I plan on going into the development world. So just start developing and buying bigger units, bigger apartment complexes, and so forth. So just really want to grow in that aspect. I love that she said real estate development because that is ultimately the cream of the crop in regards to real estate. I mean, I, I follow sports. A lot of sports owners came from real estate development, right? And so you think about that for a moment and really start understanding that that is the pinnacle of the real estate development side. And I'm sure everyone here is probably going towards that way. And that's very key to understand that. So having a five-year plan is very important. You know, knowing exactly where you're going to be at 
in the year 2029, 20, 2030 is key to understand. And, and so that's the biggest thing. Uh, I'm learning here, uh, there's a pattern, right, for those real estate practitioners right now. And I like to say this a lot. So the way I do it, because I also own doors as well, um, the commissions that we earn will pay your bills, your flips will raise your capital, that capital will be needed to buy your, your apartments, right? And then once you accumulate enough properties or investments, the equity and the appreciation that has taken over time, you'll use that equity to leverage and buy more units from there, as long as they're cash flowing at the end of the day. So it gets easier as you start accumulating more units. So it starts to, uh, I say, compound uh, over time. And so that's one thing that we have to understand. So keep that in mind. There has to be three things working at the same time, your commissions, your flips, and then your apartments. That's one of the best ways to do that. And guess what? We're in the trenches. For those real estate agents out there, we're the first ones to get these deals on our lap. Most of the time when we start in a career, we give it to our investor because we're not ready to buy it our own. But when is it going to be the time for us to say, you know what? It's my time. It's my time to get this property myself. So you guys have huge opportunity out there to go out and get more investments, especially in areas that are emerging in the Hispanic markets, right? We just seen the map out there, what the top five <coughs> Latino emerging markets at. Why don't we go there, right? Go where the money's going. And that's very key for us to understand when we do a 1031. Nora, I know you deal with a lot of uh, buyers and investments. You, got, you guys have a family-owned uh, portfolio. What are the things that you guys are looking to do um, over time in the next five years as well? So yeah, we definitely, we see the, the future in, in multifamily. Um, currently we own projects where there's 10 units, 30 units, and so we're looking into really going in, going in for bigger projects. And so, it, you know, there's always a next level, and I think that's one of the biggest things is you always can grow, can learn from someone else that's doing things much big, you know, much bigger than you, or better, or maybe netting more. Sometimes one of the things that you mentioned is, you know, you don't want to in the as you're growing in, in, as an investor, you don't want to get desperate because that's when you will lose tremendously. And many folks do get desperate and end up going into deals and losing a lot, right? So you have to do your homework. And for us, it's really going into that space, growing slowly. And one of the um, you know advices that I, the advice that I was going to give today is you know being patiently ready. So for those deals and for those opportunities, right? Having everything you need, um, being able to go to the bank being able to have the opportunity to finance, because I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity in commercial space as well in the next coming years. There's a huge, um, I think there's where it's really going to suffer pricing. We're seeing a lot of things there. So, um, you know, for us, it's growing, uh, growing strategically now that we have learned, um, we've matured in, in this space, right? Um, our family, we don't come from money, we don't, so we're constantly investing in knowing how to do it better and being around people that are doing it better, right? They're netting more and, you know, leveraging is a big one, right? Because in the in the beginning, you do have to, you know, leverage yourself. You're like, you're, you know, some of these properties are at 80% LTV, for example, so you're not making a whole lot of rental income every single month. And so, you know, learning what the, what the goal is, right? Paying some of those off, making sure that you have that. And so for us, it's, it's, we're young, you know, and that's also very important. As the, the report says, the Latinos are young. We're young in this space, and so the future looks really bright. And so being able to connect with people that are doing bigger things is, is the key, and that's why we're at NARA. You talked about strategic um, growth, and that's very key, right, and making sure that you pick your spots as you grow and not overdo it because you're just over-exuberant on wanting to grow that fast. And Julian talked about that, right, in regards to the beginning where he didn't have a system. Now he does. And so for us now, reaching out to Julian, being part of that growth, where he might look at wanting to buy more, more, um, more properties, you guys may have that in your local market. That's key when you guys talk to them at the networking reception. So it's one of the things that uh, NARA brings is that those relationships, those contacts. And this is it, right? And I'm sure in the crowd we have more uh, people here who are investors who own doors and let the but I love, language. I love it when what you said is put on, you know, your real estate agent, you're selling, but put on your investor hat. And in this room, if you start having conversations at that level, you have, you will have people that are doing things and, you know, playing at a different level and you want to make those, com have those conversations, right? No, definitely. And uh, one, th that's one of the things that we have here, right, is we have the, 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 the mindset that, uh, uh, of that long-term growth, right, that legacy. We start thinking about our kids. We start thinking about uh, what we are here to do. 
you know, I'm a big history uh, buff, and one of the things that happened back in the 1920s was the Roaring Twenties after the Great Depression. And we're looking at the same thing here, where Latinos are involved in the new Roaring Twenties of growth, uh, prosperity, and understanding that we have an opportunity here to take a grasp of all of the land that we can in America, because once we own land, our vote gets louder, and understand that. So make sure that we, as uh, Latinos and among, that investment is such a key thing for us to, to really keep in our lives, and just show our kids too, because we're, we did what we can, and our kids are there to basically take over from there, right, and understand that. So Julian, any other parting words? Gabby, Nora? Go for it, Julian. Um, I mean, if you don't, I mean, at the end of the day, start to be more intentional with, with, uh, with yeah. your investment um, strategies. So I actually started as a real estate agent, and um, I would help investors invest. And most of the time, the investors, well, they're just trying to save money. So I, they, I would do all the work. I would scout the properties, and then I would get them amazing deals. And at the end of the day, like... I'd get paid 1% to sell the property because they need to save money, but they'll use me on the next property. And then when I started seeing their returns, I was like, that's kind of when the mindset changed. And I was like, I can do this. Like, why do I have to help others grow wealth when I can do that myself? So I used real estate as a vehicle. Um, we worked really hard to make money and reinvest that money so that we can start investing ourselves. So I think as a realtor, like you said, you should leverage what you do and leverage all the tools you have access to so that you can use it as a vehicle so that you can grow your own wealth as well. Nice. Thank you very much for that. Uh, what she's talked about is the, looking at the bigger picture, right? Going from commissions now to profit, right? Going from making $10,000 commissions to making $200,000 per, per, per deal, right? That's exactly what happened. Oh, I'm, I'll be closing escrows on two, prop, two of my flips next week. One is a profit of 187, the other one is 190,000. So those two profit uh, centers are directly gonna go into investment property. Where am I gonna take that money to? Well, opportunity, understanding exactly what's going on. For those who are in Vegas and the high desert in California, that train that's being developed between uh, Apple Valley to Vegas, right, that's gonna increase demand in Apple Valley and Hesperia. I'm gonna move in 1031 all my money into those areas because once the train gets there, we're gonna see a life where someone's working in the casinos in Las Vegas and be home by dinner, dinner time that night. So what's gonna happen is rents go up, rents go up, values of properties go up, and that's where you basically start growing even more. So start listening, watching the news, and seeing what we have out there, especially here in Narep and what we're out there. I mean, these maps are not put in there just to kind of fill your mind. It's really to make you think, where can we move this money, right? And that's how we grow and keep growing from here out. So, Nora, any parting words? What I would say is just make sure that, again, you're connecting uh, with people that are doing what you want to do. So if you don't have, you know, maybe $100,000 cash right now, it's okay. There's ways that you can still get into the game, that you can understand financing, that you can get deals, Julian, like deals that already have the room in them so that you can put yourself in the deal as possibly a partner, an owner, or figure out a way, right? So just ask questions in the room today, you know, uh, after this event, go, come, to the, come up to the people here, the panel, and, and ask direct questions. This is what I'm working with. Be honest. Be authentic about what it is that you do have and what you don't have so that somebody can really help you, right? There are people, especially those that make money, they're always willing to kind of share their, their two cents and give you some ingredients. So um, all you got to do sometimes is ask and be persistent about it. You'll be surprised. Caught OPM, other people's money, all right? <laughs> We, there's a lot of people out there with money that's willing to go 50-50 as long as you find a deal, right? And they're out there. You just got to ask, like Nora said. There's so much opportunity. Just don't be scared. Just do it. Make sure you just make it happen. Be intentional. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. You, you want to say something? Julian, yes. I'll just say take the chance. Like, I didn't know anything, um, and I literally just read books, listened to podcasts, and my family doesn't come from real estate. Um, my mom was a worker at Honda, and my dad was Air Force. And now I have more equity than both of them combined. And, um, but thanks to my man over here, I have to say thank you to two people. My man G, hey, bro. I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have got my real estate license if it wasn't for you. 
and you believed in me, Tito believed in me, and those are two people that the reason why I'm up here today is because of them. And they believed in me, and then I ended up buying 32 properties and by the age of 32 in two years. So, like, right. just take great, a chance. Great story. Awesome. Uh, that, hello, hello. That concludes our panel. Thank you very much. Again, stay, stay at the end and start talking, networking. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it.